Good morning. Happy Easter. And how is everyone this morning? All right. You look good. He is risen. Amen and hallelujah. Let's stand in number 260. Christ the Lord is risen today. Let's remain standing and let's look at number 258, Christ Arose. I think many of you know how this one goes. It starts out fairly slow and then it kicks up substantially in speed where it says, Up from the grave, he arose.
I'm going to ask you to turn to the Gospel of John. This is John chapter 20, verse, one to eight, or verse 10 to, uh, actually we're going to read 8 to 18. I tacked two extra verses on it. <laughs> John chapter 20, verse 8 to 18. If you're able to, I'm going to ask you to stand in the honor of the reading of God's Word. And we do this because this is Holy Scripture. This is John chapter 20, verse 8 to 18. Here now is the word of the Lord. Then the disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed, for until then they still hadn't understood the scriptures that said Jesus must rise from the dead. Then they went home. Mary, this is referring to Mary Magdalene, was standing outside the tomb crying, and as she wept, she stooped and looked in. She saw two white-robed angels, one sitting at the head and the other at the foot of the place where the body of Jesus had been lying. Dear woman, why are you crying? The angels asked her. Because they've taken away my Lord, she replied, and I don't know where they have put him. She turned to leave and saw someone standing there. It was Jesus, but she didn't recognize him. He asked her, dear woman, why are you crying? What are you looking for? Who? Who are you looking for? She thought he was the gardener. Sir, she said, if you have taken him away, tell me where you've put him, and I'll go and get him. And Jesus said to her, Mary, and she turned to him and cried out, Rabbani, which is Hebrew for teacher. But Jesus said, don't cling to me, for I have yet ascended to my father, but go and find my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene found the disciples and told them, I've seen the Lord, then she gave them his message. Please be seated. The story of Mary Magdalene meeting Jesus at the empty tomb, it's only found in the Gospel of John. We don't know why this is the case. It's interesting this event is not listed in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, or Luke. But described as a weeping woman in an empty tomb, and she's wondering what's happened to the body of Jesus. When he suddenly appears, she doesn't recognize him. Now, although Mary Magdalene plays an important role in the life of Christ, we actually know fairly little about her. She is one of at least five different women in the New Testament who were named Mary. So we do need to be careful, otherwise we can confuse them with one another. This much we do know. She came from a village, a village called Magdala, hence she was a Magdalene. Magdala was on the shores of the Sea of Galilee, and she was one of a group of women who became followers of Christ during his time here on the earth. Luke 8.2 describes how Jesus had cast seven demons out of her. The classic translations were it seven devils. Before she met Jesus, she would have been quite enslaved to demonic powers. We don't know how she found herself in that situation, but we know this much. If one is bad, seven must be unimaginable. Her condition would have been known to others. Perhaps she was in such a troubled state, it's been speculated that she had to be set aside from the rest of society for a time, somewhat like those who had leprosy. Now, there are people who have speculated that she was the woman who was brought to Jesus after being caught in the act of adultery, but the Scripture does not specifically say that. Others say she was the woman who anointed the feet of Jesus in Luke chapter 7, but Scripture doesn't specifically say that either. What we do know is throughout church history, Mary Magdalene has become something of a symbol for repentant sinners who have come from what we would just call rough backgrounds, repentant sinners who have come to Christ. We know this much in different ways. You and I all have rough backgrounds and that without Christ we are lost. But when Christ set her free, he liberated her from those evil spirits that had figuratively and perhaps even literally kept her in chains. And Mary Magdalene is living proof that those who Jesus sets free are free indeed. And so having been liberated from that influence, she followed him wherever he went. And so it came to pass that when they took the body of Jesus down from the cross, she was there to see that awful scene. When they placed his body in the tomb, Matthew 27, 61 says she was sitting on a rock ledge watching it all happen. But very early on that Sunday morning, after the, the Sabbath had concluded at sundown on the previous day, she, she brought various spices 
hoping to finish anointing his body. We do have to remember he was quickly buried in order to finish before sundown, which is why they had not finished preparing his body according to their customs. But early in the morning, on that first day of the week, before the sun came up, she and the other women walked through the darkness of the garden to, of the garden, to that garden tomb. And they came to finish anointing his body. Now notice what this means. They went to the tomb because they expected to find the body there. You wouldn't go to a tomb if you expect it to be empty. Even though they were told that he would be raised again on the third day, as much as they loved him and trust him, they still didn't really understand what he had been telling them. But if we piece together the different accounts from that morning, it would appear Jesus rose from the dead sometime in the pre-dawn hours. Because the seal on the tomb was broken, the stone was rolled away, and Christ comes out of that tomb. And when the women found the tomb empty, I'm sure they were confused. They were probably rather frightened. The angels tell them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen, just as he said. And so the women returned to tell the disciples, who probably thought they had been seeing things. John and Peter ran to investigate, and they see the linen wrappings exactly where the body had been placed three days earlier. And then they too believed this miracle, and they left to tell the others. But when Peter and John left, Mary Magdalene stays behind. She finds it hard to accept what the angels had told her, that Jesus is truly risen. In her mind, somebody has somehow stolen the body and placed it somewhere else. Now, it has been observed by different Bible commentators, Mary Magdalene was the last at the cross and the first at the tomb. It's a high honor that really can't be said of anyone else. She was the first to see him after his resurrection. She was the first to hear his voice. The irony is is that when she sees him, she still doesn't recognize him. But once she realized it was him, you could say she became the next evangelist in Christian history. Perhaps Jesus bestowed this great honor on her because she had loved him so sincerely. Now, I think as we all know, the empty tomb is amazingly good news, but it brings a reality check to us. It is incredibly good news that Jesus rose from the dead, but it reminds us that those closest to him were still dealing with the awful reality of that death just a few days earlier. So with that in mind, I'm going to ask us to consider three different perspectives viewed through the lens of Mary Magdalene. So the first of these three perspectives is going to be Mary's sorrow. Mary's sorrow. As we read the passage from John chapter 20, Mary stands outside the tomb crying, and as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she sees the two angels in white, seated where the body had been, one at the head and one at the foot. And they asked her, why are you crying? And she responds. She says, I've taken, they've taken my Lord away. I don't know where they've put him. Scholars speculate about this. They say, look, if the body is gone, why is Mary Magdalene still there? Well, a fair guess is because she served him in life. She meant to serve him in death. She's there at the tomb all alone because even death could not destroy her love for her Lord. But here is another irony with this. She weeps. Why? Because the tomb is empty. What should have been amazingly good news apparently broke her heart. We say today that the empty tomb is perhaps the greatest proof of the physical resurrection, and yet Mary Magdalene wept. I would suggest to us that that would be a reminder. Evidence alone doesn't persuade unless it's viewed through a proper lens. Mary Magdalene had all the right facts, but she came to the wrong conclusion. You and I could do the same thing if we're not careful. When we are faced with trials and tragedies, we, we weep in that sense, internally if not openly. It's understandable. Remember, even Jesus wept. But consider the following. If Mary Magdalene had found Jesus' body still in the tomb, we would have nothing to celebrate this morning. 
you and I would have no hope for eternity. That's quite a contrast now, isn't it? Her emotions misled her, but God showed her the truth. You know, this happens in our own lives too. Our emotions can fool us, including before we come to a saving faith, our emotions can make us think that we're okay, that we don't need a Savior. The Holy Spirit is the one who gets our attention and convicts us of how mistaken we truly are. So that explains Mary's sorrow, but let's look at another aspect now. Let's look at Mary's love. She turns around and she sees Jesus standing there. She doesn't realize it's him. He says, why are you, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? This is a case when I lean towards the classic translations because it's so poetically worded. In the King James Version, it phrases it as follows, that Jesus says, Why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? Thinking he was the gardener, Mary says, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've put him. I'll go get him. Can you imagine that? She thought the risen Christ was the gardener. Maybe Jesus veiled his own identity. He did with the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, described in Luke 24. But then again, perhaps Jesus just didn't want Mary to recognize him at first because she needed to learn an important truth. That important truth is she had to learn that he is always present even when she didn't know that he was there. There's a piece of symbolism for us to think on for a bit. He is with us even when we feel so alone and even when we can't sense his presence. Those times when we're going through what's perhaps called a dark night of the soul, when we feel as if God has abandoned us, if only our perspective were not so limited, we would see the Lord walking with us every step of the way, much like that famous poster about the footprints in the sand. But do you notice the question Jesus asks her? He says, whom seekest thou? In other words, he says, who are you looking for? Not what are you looking for? That's a different question. Mary Magdalene was looking for a what? She was looking for a body. Maybe that's another reason she didn't know it was him. She wasn't looking for a risen Jesus. She was looking for something. Jesus pointed her back to someone. The answer to our deepest needs is not something. It is someone. Indeed, it is not just someone. It is the one, the Lord Jesus Christ, God himself, wrapped in human flesh. And so we have Mary's sorrow and we have Mary's love. But through it all, we have Mary's faith. Mary Magdalene's faith. Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turns to him and she calls out in Aramaic. She said, Rabbani. It means teacher or master. And Jesus said, do not hold on to me for I have not yet returned to my father. Go instead and tell my brothers, I'm returning to my father and your father, to my God and to your God. And so she went and she told the disciples, I've seen the Lord. And she told them all the things that he had said to her. So let's take note of several things here. Several things. First, Jesus calls her by name. He calls her Mary. So the risen Christ still knows her name. And in doing so, he's conveying many things to her. Among them, he's saying, I am here. I am alive. I have returned from the dead. I still know you. I still love you. And she knew his voice. And he knew her name. I think that's significant. It suggests death does not destroy personality. The essence of who we are passes through death undisturbed. But Mary was clinging to something that she must give up. Her clinging was a way of saying, I want things to be the way that they used to be. Jesus is basically saying, no, things are now going to be quite different. And very gently, Jesus begins to share what is to come. He will soon ascend to the throne of heaven, where he will take his place at the right hand of his heavenly Father. And from there, he will intercede for his followers and will fellowship with them through the Holy Spirit. But here's the amazing thing. If, if Jesus had stayed on the earth, his ministry would have been limited to the few who would see him face to face. He must leave the few in order to save the many, which includes you and I and everybody else who 
has come to believe that he is exactly who he says he is. So these are some of the issues that are covered as Jesus speaks to Mary Magdalene. Her desire for things to be like they were before is understandable. Her fear at losing him again is very understandable. It's quite human. But like so many things in our own private lives and in the life of a local church, it can't be that way because our faith is in a sense a letting go of certain comforts and preferences so that we will be more able to follow what God is calling us to be. So Mary runs and she tells the disciples what she's seen and The original language is rather vivid. If you translated it literally, word for word, it would say, Mary came telling. She probably could not stop talking about her encounter with the risen Lord. And in doing so, the mourner had become the missionary. And so it is with all of us who come to faith in the risen Christ. We're called to do as Mary Magdalene did, to run and tell all who will listen that we believe Jesus is exactly who he says he is. And Mary brought a great credibility because she could say, I was there, I saw it, I heard it, I'm giving you an eyewitness account. And this is what she experienced, and now she's going to tell all who will listen. The whole point, I think the essential significance of this on Easter Sunday is that death was defeated. And that's God's message to a world that's overwhelmed with the reality of death. God has given us the answer. The answer that we can say to all people is, fear not. Jesus Christ has defeated death once and for all time. He has risen from the grave, and so will you if you know him as your Savior. But forgiveness is universally available But I don't think the Bible teaches that it's universally applied. It is applied to those who believe, to those who admit that they are sinners, that they're lost without Christ. Repent, place your trust in Christ. The Holy Spirit calls. I would argue that he enables us to answer that call, but yet we must answer that call. The price has been paid Redemption is available universally, and it is available to us freely, but it was not free, was it? The price was more than we can ever imagine, and it was paid by the only one who could ever pay it, God himself, literally wrapped in human flesh. That's why this morning we share the good news. We remind one another. We want to remind others. As we go up to one another, we smile and we say good morning. And we say, He is risen. And together we say, He is risen indeed. Hallelujah and Amen. Well, now let's go to number 256. This is the Bill Gaither tune. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. (laughs) 